Good evening, everyone. My name is Geeta Loganstein. I'm the creative producer of The Capital at RMIT, and welcome to This Is Public, Open House Melbourne's opening night. To those of you currently watching from lockdown around Australia, I hope you're doing okay and that tonight's event provides some cultural relief. As you're aware, This Is Public was originally planned to take place as a live event at the Capitol itself. But as Melbourne is again in lockdown, we are instead broadcasting from RMIT University's state-of-the-art television studios. I'm here with a skeleton crew who are masked up and socially distancing and we'll be bringing all our speakers into the studio from their respective homes. Our teams have worked incredibly hard to bring you this live event, and I'd like to thank my RMIT colleagues, Eric, Tim, Isabella, Luke, Chris, Matt, James, and Kiri, amongst a cast of hundreds. I'll now hand over to Nawi Carolyn Briggs, a Boon Wurrung senior elder, for our welcome to country. Enjoy the evening, and over to you, Auntie Carolyn. Woman Jika Maran Big Big Bunarong Namda Barapton Arpa Willem. Come with a purpose to our beautiful home, the lands of the two great bays. My name is Noe Dr. Carolyn Briggs, and I'm a proud descendant of the Yalikat Willem of the Bunwarong of the Kulin Nation. And I'd like to extend my welcome to all of you who are present tonight and to the mayor who will, who will be in this um, room tonight. And it's about this celebration of coming together. And it is about the persons of why we're here. What is our purpose for being here? So, it is my pleasure to welcome you all here today, but it is my responsibility to ensure that you do come with a purpose. Wamandika, I do so not on behalf, only on behalf of my ancestors of the Yelikat Willem of the Bunwarang. I do so be on behalf of all First Nations on which lands we may meet today. First Nations peoples across Australia all share a special connection to the lands and waters of their ancestors that has not been disconnected since millennia, despite the dispossession, the discrimination that we've all experienced over the last 200 years. These connections date back to our creation stories. For the Yalika Willem of the Bunwarang, our creation stories tells us about Bunjo, our creator spirit who travels as an eagle and how he created the lands and waters around where we meet today. He also created the Kulin people and taught them about the circular relationships that we have with these lands and waters in order for us to be taken care of by the land. We also had to take care of the land and we did this through adhering to the Warongi Bik our laws of the land, our customary laws. Much like our laws today, these laws dictate how we interact with each other, how we interact with the land, and how we conduct ourselves while we're on other people's country. The Bunwarang Warongi Bik speaks of three Pacific laws. The first law is your language, knowledge. It is the responsibility that we have knowledge. And once knowledge has been attained, we have the responsibility to ensure that it's survival, it's continuation. We have the responsibility to our younger generations to maintain that knowledge and pass it down so it can be used for future generations. We also have the law of Jambana, this law speaks of community, the importance of community. The Bunwarang people and the Kulin Nation understood the power of diversity that is within our lands and in, in, that increases our capability. It was always good to share stories and the different experiences. However, they understood how to utilize 
this very powerful tool. They had to identify a common purpose. And what are the things that we do have in common? Finally, the last law is connection to country, or we might call pavanata, or honouring sacred ground, paying respects to our past generations, the people who took care of the land before us, the people who have lived and died on the land before we were here, paying respects to those stories and histories on a land on which we live today. We are very fortunate in this continent we now know as Australia to have 80,000 years of human history. And it is most important to pay respects to that history, not only while we're here at work, but also when we go home. And if you can adhere to those three Warongi Beks, I can say in the words of my ancestors once again, Wamandika, I'm Naran Big Big, Bunarong, Namdurp, Barapten, Ata Willem, come with a purpose to our beautiful home, Nungujin. Hello everyone, I'm Sally Cat, Lord Mayor of Melbourne. It's my great pleasure to join you for This Is Public, the 2021 Open House Melbourne Weekend. On behalf of the City of Melbourne, I acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we're all gathered and pay our respects to their elders past and present. I acknowledge their care of our land as the longest continuous living culture in the world and I value their central role as we shape Melbourne's future together. Thank you too to Bunurang Elder Nawit Dr Carolyn Briggs AM. Thank you for your welcome to country. Thank you to Fleur Watson, who's the Executive Director and Chief Curator of Open House Melbourne. Thank you to all of today's distinguished guest speakers and to everybody who's been involved as a sponsor and a donor. A humongous congratulations to everyone at the Open House Melbourne team for working behind the scenes to make sure that this event could go ahead online. My sincere gratitude to you for pirouetting in these most difficult times to ensure that we could participate in this stimulating and inspiring festival. Exploring and debating our city's architecture and urban design is so important and the City of Melbourne is proud to be a supporter through our event partnership program. Of course, we wish that we could all be together for this event, but we can still satiate our curiosity and our passions virtually through this wonderful program. In this world of total disruption, it's great for good minds to come together to explore opportunities that this disruption presents. I love the theme for this year's program. It's all about reconnection and a focus on public spaces and everything that that entails. It's more important than ever that we find ways to reconnect people and places around the city and to think afresh about Melbourne's future. How can we reimagine the ways that we use our city, our neighbourhoods, our offices, our buildings, our open spaces? How will we harness the lessons that we've learned? How do we carry those forward to co-design a more connected and cohesive future for everybody? This year's program is closely aligned to our community vision for a marvellous Melbourne, a city of possibility. It's about creating a future where we push our boundaries, we can strive to reach our full potential and we can get excited about what's possible, even tackling the seemingly impossible. The environment created through bricks and mortar and through our green open spaces and waterways is a critical platform on which we can engage, motivate, stimulate and accomplish as individuals and as a community. This is public is all about this and more and we want to thank the team and the roles that you play in sustaining and driving Melbourne forward. This weekend revel in the appreciation and the stimulation of this program, everything to do with architecture and urban design. Thank you again to the organisers for our virtual tours and the most fascinating discussions and debates. Please enjoy the Melbourne Open House program. We look forward to welcome you back to Melbourne to explore our wonderful city when it's safe to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Mayor, for that very warm and insightful introduction. 
and for the City of Melbourne's much valued support for Open House Melbourne for over the past 14 years. My sincere thanks also to Nuit, Dr. Carolyn Briggs, for your generous and wonderful welcome to country. We are so grateful that you were able to be with us this evening. And it's my great pleasure to introduce the 2021 Open House Melbourne program and our theme of Reconnect and to host this evening's opening speaker series program, This Is Public. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge that programming for Open House Melbourne exists on what was and always will be the land of the people of the Kulin Nation. I pay my respects to Elders, past, present and emerging, as well as to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the wider community of Melbourne and beyond. Indigenous sovereignty has never been ceded in Australia and as an organisation, Open House Mel Melbourne is mindful of this in everything we do, given our focus on the modern built environment. Tonight, This Is Public's event is live streamed for everyone to enjoy, wherever you are in Australia or the world. It's also recorded and at a later date, it'll be post-produced and widely released as a podcast series. So please sign up to our newsletter so you don't miss that series. Reconnect is an online program of events, experiences, talks and building tours for the much loved Open House Weekend, which of course is tomorrow, Saturday the 24th and Sunday the 25th of July. Due to lockdown 5.0, tonight's opening event and our weekend program may not quite be what we originally intended. We imagined a hybrid program offering both physical and digital opportunities to reconnect with the spaces, places and people of our great city. Yet we know that Victorians and the open house community will seize the opportunity to engage with this fully online program now available to everyone. The theme of reconnect speaks directly to our collective desire to re-engage with our city, our suburbs and our regions, and to reimagine our future together with fresh eyes and open minds as we continue to experience the effects of pandemic, lockdown and isolation. As our community grapples with what might constitute a, no a new normal, it's clear that we must reconnect and envisage transformative ways to live and work better together. This year, Open House Melbourne asks us to reimagine the way we'll occupy our city, our homes, our places of work, our civic and educational institutions, our community spaces and our meeting places. Through these adaptive changes, we can reclaim the agency for design in shaping the public good and in turn, redesign our values, systems and spaces to achieve a more adaptable, equitable and sustainable future for our built environment. Open House Melbourne is presented by the Centre for Architecture Victoria, a new umbrella organisation for all things open house and with a focus on year long programming. In this year's programming, there is over 80 online experiences to immerse yourself in, including VR tours, online Q and A's, exhibitions, talks, films, and many programs on offer, all from the comfort of your own home. Tonight, I'm gonna to share just 10 of those 80 plus experiences that we've curated in response to this theme of Reconnect, and which we at Open House Melbourne believe are contributing to our city and our communities for the better. So you can see here in this first group of slides, um, you can see the newly completed University of Melbourne, Melbourne Connect precinct designed by Woods Baggett and Hable with fit outs by Hassel, Architectus and Aspect. Now this new innovation hub is part of the Melbourne Innovation District, which sees the City of Melbourne, the University of Melbourne, RMIT, along with many other partners, really working together to transform this area north of the CBD. The precinct also includes the newly launched Science Gallery Melbourne, designed with Smart Design Studio okay, and I had my microphone off. And this is, is part okay? of a worldwide network of science galleries. <laughs> Here you can see its brick facade and its glass interactive bricks. 
the Melbourne Connect teams and the Science Gallery Melbourne will be conducting live uh, tours and talks tomorrow at one and three respectively. So log on to our website, you need to register for those. Uh, so you can do that now. These next two projects really speak to spaces that support a deep sense of pride and community, yet in very different scales and contexts. Here we can see the newly completed Victorian Bride, uh, Pride Centre by James Brearley Architecture and Urban Design with Grant Amon Architects. Now I'm not going to talk too much about this project because we're going to hear a little bit later this evening from Justine Della Riva as well as James Brearley about the making of Pride and the Pride Centre. Um, but just to say that this is an incredible seven story community place, a home to 15 LGBTIQ organisations with meeting spaces, a cultural hub, a theatrette, a gallery, rooftop spaces. So it is really a very special project. And next we can see this project, the Melbourne Quaker Centre at a very different scale. Um, and also speaking online tomorrow, at this time at 1 p.m., will be Toby Reed of Navenga Reed Architecture and Peter Hogg from PH Architects, who will really talk about the design and the community consultation process behind this new Melbourne Quaker Centre. And you can see this incredible interior space that's been created. So please uh, join tomorrow and uh, you can uh, be part of that behind the scenes conversation um, via our website. These next two images really speak to the idea of public life and the civic in both the CBD and also our suburbs. Here you can see um, the Immigration Museum and Hey Neighbour is a new initiative of a group called the Neighbourhood Circle that connects the Immigration Museum with residents, small business, building owners, social and creative enterprises that are drawn by the four blocks in the city bounded by Collins, Linda Street, Queen and William Street. Now, this idea is very simple, but it's very powerful. Rather than being siloed, how can these multiple communities work together to collectively reinvigorate this precinct and re-establish creative production into the CBD? There's a panel discussion led by uh, the Turning Circle's Robert Buckingham tomorrow at 1.30, so please tune in for that. This next image is the Town Hall Broad Meadows. And the recent upgrade to the building by Kirsten Thompson Architects speaks to our suburban condition and how skillful and adaptive reuse design can pay respect to the embedded memories of a community from the past while creating a new dialogue with the public and a meaningful place to come together again. It's imbued with civic community and commercial uses, so it really positions itself as a 21st century building. It's a place for celebration, as it always has been, but also a place for new employment skills and creative ideas. And coming soon, post lockdown, we'll be doing building tours with KTA and the Hume City Council at this wonderful project. This next image speaks to infrastructure. And the award-winning Caram Station design illustrates how an infrastructure project such as the level crossing removal, can result in a new public precinct, square and landscape that contributes greatly to its community. A town square, as you see, as you can see here, has been created at the station's entrance and a new foreshore park links the heart of Carrum to the bay. The Frankston rail line also traces ancient indigenous movement paths. And so there's a number of meaningful cultural sites that are located in this precinct. Traditional owners have co-designed a range of spaces, including the Karen Karen Bridge across Patterson River, the Yarning Circle, and this 12 meter urban marker, which was inspired by Bunjil, the spiritual creator of the bay. There's an online talk uh, both tomorrow and Sunday across the program with Cox Architecture and, and WSP partners to really give a, a sense of behind the scenes of the design process for this award-winning precinct. And these final images speak to projects of various type and scale that recognise Indigenous sovereignty and what it means to design on country. 
here we can see this basketball court in Queensbridge Street, South Bank, a very small but important project on our walking tour, which is a self-guided map downloadable from our website. And if it's within your five kilometre radius, you might be able to visit it over the weekend or perhaps immediately after lockdown. But this temporal artwork by Indigenous artist Rico Rennie really inverts the idea of camouflage to amplify and bring attention to a discussion about the future of this place, Kingsway Undercroft, and how this space and its infrastructure might be better designed to com really contribute to the future of its community in its immediate surrounds. These final two images speak to an ongoing collaboration with the Koori Heritage Trust, first developed in 2017. Here you can see the Trust's interior, designed by Indigenous Architecture and Design Victoria with lions, which is just one of the sites indicated on this next image, which is a printed and online map. And this map, again, is available from the Koori Heritage Trust and from our website over the weekend, downloadable. And it describes just some of the many sites of Indigenous significance found across Coolum, Melbourne. But it is by no means a complete list. It's a continuing partnership between us at Open House Melbourne, the Koori Heritage Trust and Indigenous Architecture and Design Victoria. The sites have been selected by Jeetha Greenaway, who we will hear from a little bit later with his project in between, and the map designed by Latoya Mararu. So these 10 images capture only a really small selection of the projects, modest to large, that speak to the theme of reconnect and envisage a more positive future for our city as part of the 2021 Reconnect online program. And now I'm really pleased to be able to introduce tonight's fantastic lineup of speakers, all of whom will speak to their own practice, research and ideas in the creation and transformation of a more progressive, inclusive and adaptable city for us all. And our first speaker tonight is Jill Garner, the Victorian Government Architect. Jill took the helm at the OVGA in 2015, stepping into the role as a public advocate for architecture and design after more than 20 years in practice. Tonight, Jill will speak on the theme of designing policy for people, which is also the topic of her online guided walk with Hamish Lyon of NH Architecture this Sunday at 11 a.m. as part of the Open House Melbourne program. Over to you, Jill. Great, thanks so much, Fleur. Um, good evening, everyone. And I think I would just start also by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land, the various lands probably on which we meet and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. And I'd also like to acknowledge their continuing connection to country, their custodianship and the responsibility that we all have to act with the same regard for place. Uh, my discussion tonight um, offers a glimpse into what is often an invisible part of public projects, the stories behind the public projects. And it's a precursor to the um, public walking tour that Hamish Lyon and I are giving, um, will be leading on Sunday morning, um, which Fleur just mentioned. And our tour is going to follow a path from west to east along the south bank of the Yarra River, stopping at, to look at various projects. And our issue really, or our, our interest, is that every project has a story to tell. Now, as most of you will be aware, um, I have the privilege of being Victoria's government architect. And government is a large and an important client of design. And a critical legacy for any government is always seen in the quality of the public projects that that government delivers. We know that well-designed buildings, infrastructure and public places work well and they feel good, they promote community pride, identity, and they add valuable long-term assets to their locale. 
Good design outcomes very rarely just happen. Something sits behind them. It might be a great vision. It might be an ambition. It might be a set of principles. Sometimes it's an insightful policy. Good design can't happen without skilled and capable design teams. And usually there's a champion. There's an advocate, an individual with the passion and the commitment to push towards a really great outcome. Having grown up in Melbourne and having been an active participant in its growth and its change over several decades, it's made me incredibly aware of those moments in our city's history, which are often called our sliding door moments, when an outcome could have gone one way or another. We could have ended up with something quite different. I've chosen a few instances to share in this discussion today because I like the stories that are behind them. And I think that each of these moments have had very real impact. I have to admit, I also breathe a sigh of relief when I think about what might have come out of each of these moments. Each of these instances that I'm going to talk about might highlight a brave decision. It might highlight a, a brave or a committed individual. Sometimes it talks to an intelligent community that's pushing for reform, but each moment is important because it's an instance of designing policy for people. Next slide, please. Melbourne has had a continuous tram service since 1884. Um, it's a really unique system. It's grown into something quite incredible. And it's unusual globally to see both north, south and east, west trams that follow our city grid. By 2017, we had the largest urban tram network in the world. However, if we step back a few years to the 1960s, we can find that there was heated argument about our tram system. Like many places in the world at this time, we were loving our cars. We were a new world city. And we were building expanded residential suburbs that were highlighting the difference between the city as a place of commerce and the suburb as a place to live. So after years of debate about whether the tram was actually an outmoded form of transport, there's a great urban myth that recalls Melbourne by 1970 managing to hold on to its tram system by just one vote. But what we know is that this wasn't luck. History suggests that it was the fierce determination of a dedicated individual. There he is, Major General Sir Robert Risson, and he was an engineer, a soldier, and he was chairman of the Melbourne and Metropolitan Tramways Board from 1960 to 1970. Records suggest that Risson, I love these words, continually and forcefully, probably in good military style, made the case that this means of transit was still needed in one of Australia's most populous cities. So, largely due to this man, Melbourne kept its trams which have become both iconic and synonymous with the active transport nature of our city. I've had a lot of visiting architects to Melbourne and urban designers who've been um, intrigued on, by our system and that they note how unusual and successful it is to see a street grid also housing a serviced urban grid, uh, an urban tram grid as well. Sometimes I think what's interesting about this moment in Melbourne is that sometimes good city decisions are really hanging by just a thread. Next slide. The 1970s in Melbourne was a time of significant importance in what our city was to become. And it was really a critical moment for architecture in our city. I've heard 1972 called the year of the wrecker. The demolition of the Federal Coffee Palace there it is there, the, what, the building with the tower at 555 Collins Street, was a seminal moment when too many of our spectacular Victorian era buildings were demolished. 
So a defiant group of Melburnians comprising members from the National Trust, from um, the construction unions, and a group, a new group called the Collins Street Defence Movement rallied together in an attempt to stop the wanton demolition of too many of our heritage buildings. This was a community-driven revolution and it was in full and very interesting swing when I went to university. Um, there's several individuals who could be called up here, who could be on my screen to be highlighted for their involvement in this movement, but I've chosen to acknowledge the first formal president of the defence movement, Evan Walker. This moment in our history caused a seminal change in our city, and we started to consider the value in layering our historic city with the new, rather than continuing wholesale replacement of buildings, which had been so typical right through the 1960s. So the awareness of the value in layering our city starts here. The strength of our city grid, together with this slightly shifted architectural attitude of respect for the quality of our architectural past, has actually managed to provide quite a rational framework that's made it somehow okay that we now play host to what are really sometimes quite irreverent contemporary buildings that, that sit adjacent to these um, remnants from the past. So from this moment during the 70s and 80s, we can pin this down as the moment our city might become an awesome hybrid of both old and new. Next. Professor Evan Walker stays on my radar for moment number three, which is the vision for reconceiving the south bank of the river as a dynamic new precinct for our city, rather than its industrial backyard. It's not common for architects to enter politics. Evan Walker probably puts a case forward that more, more of our, our membership should because he stepped from being a practicing architect into being a member of parliament in, in the early 1980s. And he was in, 19, in, in the early 80s, Professor Walker was appointed minister for planning and he brought vision, foresight, influence and opportunity to his role in state government. He also appointed David Yenkin as the state secretary for planning and together, these two have been described as a powerhouse for novel ideas about urban renewal. The first of their ideas concerned South Bank. So until the 1980s, South Bank was made up of one and two storey derelict factories. Historically, the river was a delivery route and over many years, waste dumped from industry had meant that it had little amenity, little beauty and very little status. Between them, Walker and Yenkin understood the public place possibilities that were inherent in the edge of our river. A master plan vision embraced what the, the river could be, and it introduced the promenade on the south side, suggesting that the river could be an asset instead of an embarrassment. And we've built on this vision ever since. The state has continued to invest in important civic projects that extend this river edge experience. Next. So Professor Yenkin stays on my screen for moment number four. 1992 saw the closure of Swanston Street to everyday traffic, but the story of Swanston Street really starts um, in the previous decade. Really uh, in the 1980s, in mid eighties, Swanston Street was a gloomy car clogged thoroughfare. The heavy traffic it meant pollution, it meant poor amenity and a less than safe urban environment. So as part of, as part of Victoria's 150th celebrations, Professor Yenkin had the radical idea of hosting a garden party in Swanston Street. So for the weekend of the 9th and 10th of February, more than 13,000 square metres of real grass was rolled out along four blocks of Swanston Street. 
it was a really brave concept that was almost stopped at the last minute by politicians who were very nervous about community backlash. However, for this one weekend, tens of thousands of families picnicked enthusiastically in this street garden. And the headline in The Age called it the garden party to end all garden parties. What was so important about this moment was that Professor Yankin's real agenda was a, quite a dramatic way of nudging public opinion towards a proposition that Swanston Street might become a pedestrian thoroughfare. And in March 1992, Swanston Street was officially closed to daytime private through traffic. Pavements were widened, trees were planted, and later proposals to reverse the decisions attracted considerable opposition. Quite a turnaround for Melbourne. Next. There was a serious lack of people in the city when I was a student in the 1970s and 1980s. Melbourne was a place of relatively constrained nine to five commerce. And in 1978, there's even um, a, a great piece of commentary from Norman Day, who described Melbourne as having an empty, useless city centre. As we watch Melbourne struggle with the COVID lockdown, I'm reminded of this time. I'm reminded of the effort, the policies, the programs and the people who, shel who helped shape the city into, the, into what we know it to be today. And I'm reminded of the groundswell of occupancy change that took place throughout the city of Melbourne with their Postcode 3000 program. In 1992, by changing a local policy to provide incentives for people to live in the central city, we saw the first wave of revisioned old buildings and warehouses, conversions of unoccupied lower grade office buildings and a new vision for city apartments. This policy transformed our city from a commercial business centre, difficult to occupy after hours, into a busy residential and much occupied 24-7 city. And it, it's quite surprising to many that it was only then, and we're, we're talking mid-1990s, it seems so surprisingly recent, that policies were also changed to allow pavement dining. And at the same time, urban design amenity enhancements took place, planting hundred, hundreds of trees, widening of pavements, and these are all outcomes that encouraged the new residents of the city to occupy the city streets. Next, government continued to invest in high profile civic pr projects along the river edge as we emerged out of the 1990s recession that we had to have. And riding on this wave of decisions that were impacting the shape and the way we occupy the city, another very important moment for architecture and urban design took place in 1997. A commitment was made to demolish two 1960s international style government buildings. There they are, the gas and fuel buildings that blocked the city from the river. They happened to be owned by government so they were, it, it was a decision that was able to be taken by government at the time. This River Edge site, of course, went on to become Melbourne's Federation Square, an outdoor place that's become the location where our city gathers. The design, Melbourne's very first experience of the digital impact on architecture was the result of an international competition judged by an eminent jury and won by Lab Architecture Studio. The design is a reaffirmation of Melbourne's vital, fluid, interactive, walkable urbanism. Although the complex geometries sit in, um, in contrast really to the orthogonal city grid. It's familiar, but it's unfamiliar. Hugely con controversial, loved and hated in equal measure. It's embedded itself in Melbourne's patterns of use. And in 2019, it became the first 21st century building in Australia or place in Australia to be put on the heritage register. Next piece. So on Sunday, Hamish and I are teaming up to take you on a virtual tour 
along the edge of the river and we're going to visit 18 projects. We'll be starting our journey in Docklands at, next slide, at the M Pavilion, which sits in Docklands Park, Amanda Levette's Pavilion, and we're going to wind our way past the Mission to Seafarers along, next slide, Webb Bridge. And we'll cross this bridge, we'll take in the Convention Centre, Jeff's Shed, Hamer Hall, we'll cross Prince's Bridge to Federation Square. And we will arrive at Tenderum Bridge, we'll traverse Birurung Ma, we'll look at the Federation Bells Bridge, we'll cross this bridge to next Margaret Court Arena at Melbourne Olympic Park, home obviously to an array of extraordinary number of venues for both sports and entertainment. So next slide, please. So each of these projects that we're going to talk about, there'll be 18 of them, and each of them has a story behind it. Why was it conceived? When was it conceived? Why is it important? How has it impacted the way that we engage with our city? And possibly um, a little bit of discussion between Hamish and I about is it any good? So Hamish and I are live on Sunday morning. You won't need your walking shoes or your umbrella anymore. Just join us from your armchairs or your couch. Thank you. And thank you so much, Jill, for that uh, talk and reminding us that it's people that shape our city that in turn uh, shapes us. So I'm really delighted to now introduce uh, Ewan McEwen and Liam Young, who will be talking about Planet City. Ewan McEwen is the Senior Curator of Contemporary Art, Design and Architecture at the National Gallery of Victoria. Liam Young is a renowned speculative architect and director whose recent project, Planet City, was commissioned by the NGV as part of the 2020 Triennale. Now, before uh, Ewan joins us, he's here in Melbourne, and Liam joins us from LA, I'd like you to sit back just for a few minutes and immerse yourself in this short three-minute excerpt of Planet City before Ewan and Liam tease out the ideas in the film and the theme of provocative urbanism.
Liam, hello. Sorry, I wasn't sure if we were on yet. How are you? Hi, Ewan. Great to join you on the interwebs. Um, <laughs> in, uh, here we are, midnight in, here in America. Midnight in Los Angeles. Ah. It's 1 a.m. in Los Angeles, actually, but who's counting? Exactly. Oh, well, once you're up late, you're up late. That's fantastic. Yeah. Hey, look, um, it's it's great to see you again, and it's great to see that little excerpt again. Um, and I forgot that it um, really sets the scene so well with the text, etc. But what I wanted to start with really is just to give you that opportunity, I suppose, the um, to to quickly just um, in your own way um, set the scene of what what have people just watched? What is what is Planet City as a project? Because of course this is a film; it's a work of speculative architecture. What did you set out um, to do um, while while making the the film? Yeah, I mean, Planet City is a is a fiction shaped like a city. Uh, it's an imaginary city for ten billion people, the projected global global population of uh, twenty fifty. Um, and really, it's it's created in response to the rising red line on the graph of climate change. Because um, I mean, I'm a world builder. I, I I'm a, trained as an architect, but I create environments for the film and television industry. And I'm interested in the way that world building and storytelling, in a way, is not just about visualizing data, but but rather dramatizing data. So in speculative cities like this one we can immerse ourselves in the various consequences of the decisions we face today. They can be both cautionary tales or roadmaps to an aspirational future. So Planet City is, is, is really an experiment in massive um, consolidation. You know, what would happen if we radically reversed the planetary sprawl that we all occupy and shrink and consolidate um, uh, human development into a single city. Uh, it's, a, it's a thought experiment, um, a thought experiment that hopefully talks about the ways that, you know, we don't need to trample so heavily across the earth. Um, if we can get systems working at the scale of 10 billion people at Planet City, um, then there is really nothing stopping us um, doing similar kinds of consolidation at the scale of our more familiar cities like Melbourne or Los Angeles. Mm. Um, so it's a it's provocation a, it, in that sense. It is, a, and we're, to, we're here to talk about that provocation, indeed. And um, it's really interesting for me, though, because we've we've talked we've obviously talked a lot about this project over the years of its development. And um, how has the last? So, you know, obviously, um, this was pre-COVID um, as one thing to take into consideration, but also. The, the recent months uh, or the recent um, events in Los a in, in the on the um, on the west coast of the United States I mean how has the um, how do you feel that the the really immediate sort of you've released this film it's gone from from Melbourne to other cities around the world but it feels like the stakes have changed in in the in the period between conceiving and producing the film and, and, and releasing it to the world. And I just, I'm fascinated on your um, thoughts on that. Yeah, in many ways, the dystopias of science fiction that, that previously read as speculative cautionary tales are now for the most part, the stage sets of the everyday. Um, we're living out our lives in a disaster film playing in real time. Um, uh, in many cases, the future is decidedly broken. Um, so I, I guess we were interested in this moment without a future um, as this slow motion catastrophe of climate change begins to envelop us at a speed that actually makes it now uncomfortable to ignore. Um, we wanted to tell a different kind of story, um, a counter narrative um, for a concentrated city um, uh, and, you know, something like climate change for a lot of us has always been um, something of a future. It was something that was going to happen to our kids or our grandkids. Um, we're now in the middle of the most ridiculous heat wave um, in human history. Um, uh, it, it, it's becoming really, really hard to deny the science um, and increasingly necessary to start to think about 
what are the necessary lifestyle changes that might be required if we want to maintain some level of human existence on this planet? And they're really uncomfortable questions. And Planet City is very much an uncomfortable solution. Um, and uh, as it's been rolled out across the world, it certainly led to some uncomfortable conversations. Um, a lot of people want to read it as a, as a solution. Um, it's much easier to write a headline. Um, you know, Liam Young creates a, a, a solves cl climate change by sticking us all in a city, a single city for 10 billion people, um, as opposed to the provocation, which is really getting into, which is this idea that climate change is no longer a technological problem. It's a cultural problem. Indeed. Um, the, the, yeah. the solutions to, to, dig us, to dig us out of this hole are actually already here. Um, they're just held back by political bias or lack of cultural investment. Um, and that's what Planet City does, is just embrace those systems and roll them out at scales that are meaningful. Indeed. And it's, 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 it's interesting that, like, as an architect, as a world builder, when we talk about this as a work of speculative architecture, it's it's interesting when you watch the full film that that the architecture is very much the backdrop, and and it's not it's not what you would um, it's an assemblage of known architectures. It's the recycling of everything we have already. Um, so for me, what's fascinating is that it's more about the soft tissue of the city. It's more about people, and I think in terms of this idea of the the theme tonight of reconnect it's this sense of um uh th this is only possible with a new way a, a new attitude and a new way of people working together and um, you describe planet city as both a dystopia and a utopia and certainly at the beginning of the conversation for this film was this sense of what might it look like if we got it right so i'm just curious if you could talk through um your perspective on on Planet City as a social movement, Planet City as a migration, and 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 also as a um, this idea of nation states give way to a shared shared culture. So that's a that's kind of interesting um, thought. One city, there are no countries. How does that work? So um, talk us through that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, if we if we follow on from the last thought that that you know, the climate change is a cultural problem. And the battleground of, of that discussion and debate is in, is in social movements and, um, and political and, and, and popular opinion. Um, so, I mean, Planet City is hopefully a project that operates um, and has currency within um, those channels. Um, so yeah, really it was, it was trying to prototype a, a multi-generational migration. A large-scale, um, uh, willing consolidation of of everything that we've currently made. You know, um, you know, we, we, we're we're at a point um, where kind of hu human-centric design focus has created the world that we're currently in, the world on fire. Um, so it's trying to prototype a way of thinking beyond uh, a model that puts ourselves and our own desires and needs at the center of everything that we do. Um, so it's it's multi-generational, it's multi-species, um, and it's it, it's kind of informed not by the traditions of genius architects solving the world problems with with their genius design visions, um, but rather it, it's, it's much more modeled on social movements like the global climate strike um, uh, or the women's march. Um, or hashtag activism. Um, it imagines a condition where, you know, these kind of movements are evidence of um, you know, the largest mo mobilization of human bodies ever before seen. Um, and they've been coordinated through the network. Um, and they've been coordinated in such a way that, that seems much more powerful than any movements that a singular nation state have done in relationship to climate change. You know, if, if anything, what we've seen across the last several years is, is the total incapacity and attitude of traditional systems of power to do anything about problems at the scale that we're facing. But the potential of um, large scale coordinated civic action um, 
becomes interesting. And that's what Planet City is. It's a it's a multi-generational civic action where everyone comes to a global consensus to to do less, um, to tread lightly. Mm -hmm. um, perhaps that's the utopian aspect of the project. <laughs> and, and the fact that it's a... Um... A twenty-four hour party that, that's going on in the city while we while we fly through it. Um, that, well, that's actually a pragmatic aspect to... of the project. But but uh, but where, when we map when we put everyone in one place and you map every cultural festivity that goes on in that one place, you realise that on any given day there's like fifty parties going on. So um, Planet City is a fun place to be. It is. So um, what? What would you take, you know, so, I mean, obviously this is a highly speculative um, film, but but it's got elements. I mean, the the, 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 the the practical elements, let's talk about very quickly, like you've worked with people like Holly Buck, who's a, ge a geoengineer based in the United States. You've worked with advisors, economists, scientists um, around the world. Um, it, it, Planet City is not um, a, a technological speculation about some some solution that's going to emerge in the future with with a new way of doing things is it it's it's very much about what we have around us today yeah i mean a lot of science fiction cities will will kind of imagine new technologies right? like we've invented a material that's lighter than air so all the buildings float now or we've created the hyperloop and and you can travel from new york to london in 15 minutes um there's no technology in Planet City that doesn't already exist today. Um, so it's a, uh, it, it's a speculation that's very much grounded in the real science and technology of the present moment. Um, so to begin the project, we, we traveled around the world. We, 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 we visited and researched and filmed a lot of the mega scale renewable energy sites that already exist. You know, the world's largest solar field um, in, in India, the, the illuminated indoor farms of uh, protecting crops in harsh Siberian winters, um, the most productive wind energy network in Gansu, China. Um, these monumental infrastructures are evidence that much of the technologies required to regenerate our, our climate are actually already here, just kind of hiding in plain sight. Um, and what we the simple move we made with Planet City was to explore what would happen if we remove the political roadblocks or the lack of cultural investment that currently holds them back and visualize how they could operate at global scales, not just out on a on some kind of industrial or forgotten periphery, but what woven through the very fabric of the city itself. Um, uh, mm -hmm. So what we see is actually, you know, um, uh, you know a very calculated uh, city model. Um, uh, so again, if, if we can get it working at 10 billion people, um, yeah, the only people to blame for, for not, not doing it in Melbourne are, are, are ourselves, our own prejudices, biases and contradictions. <laughs> so which, which, um, uh, which aspects of the, of the city, I mean, for you then, um, mm -hmm. I mean, because there's, there's, there's a sort of, um, Underpinning it is also this sense of um, uh, a resistance, I suppose, towards um, uh, corporatized global supply chains. This idea of the, the, the sort of industrial hinterland and how much, how we use land agriculturally, etc. So that intensity that you're describing um, allows um, allows us to really focus. I mean, I think there's a statistic in the book that you published with the the um, with the film, which is at the highest density that we currently have working successfully um, in cities, we put all of the humans together in one place, it would take up 0.2% or 0.02% of, of, the, of the surface of the planet. And the rest, it, it would in effect be able to be um, uh, returned in some way to wilderness. I mean, that's sort of the, the fundamental and this, Talk us through the time frame that you had imagined there. This is not something that is a is not necessarily an immediate and uh, orchestrated move, and it's not something that's permanent. No, I mean it, it's not. It, it's not like a like some kind of decree by a centralized global government that says, right, next Tuesday, pack your bags, we're all moving in. 
um, it, it, as I mentioned, it, it, it grows from a, from a global consensus that, that may take multiple generations to happen. Um, uh, it, it's you know, uh, a, a signifier of, of the necessity for long-term thinking that's required in, in response to, to the conditions that we're facing. Um, a long-term thinking that, that is designed to return 98, 99.8 percent of the planet to to some kind of rewilded condition, or at least very least the return of stolen lands that that kind of Western colonialization has has taken, um, and extractive capitalism has has um, has dug up, um, uh, with a mind to at some point being able to return to that landscape. In the book, um, we, we also commissioned a, a whole list of really amazing speculative fiction writers and science fiction authors to write stories set in Planet City. Um, one of the writers is, is Ryan Griffin, um, who the audience here might know as, as the director and creator of uh, the Clever Man series on ABC. Um, he wrote a short story um, uh, from an Australian indigenous perspective um, talking about an elder who who has moved to Planet City and carries with her a jar of soil um, from country, and it, the the story is a conversation between her and um, and a young girl talking about one day taking that jar back to country um, uh, and what it means to be dislocated from place, um, but also um, being a steward of that land. And ultimately, um, uh, imagining returning. Um, so it's it's not you know some kind of dystopian walled city that we can never go out. Uh, Kim Stanley Robinson also wrote a short story in the book talking about these kind of hot air balloon sojourns that we might make through what becomes the national park of the world, um, visiting this landscape um, uh, on the weekends, um, checking in on it, occupying it in the way we occupy a national park. You know. You know, moving through it, exploring it, but but leaving no trace behind, um, and that's part of the the interest for us. Is 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 yeah, the rewilding the earth is a is a large scale project, um, and it takes time. Um, and really, you know, to uh, Holly's Holly's essay in the book talks about the necessity to to draw down carbon at a scale of the contemporary extraction industry. Right? And that's really what we're talking about here is a massive mobilization of labor and resources um, of a scale of the last hundred years of industrialization. Digging all this material up out of the ground is required to put it all back. Um, uh, and that's the kind of ambition and, and scale of thinking that we really need. Mm. I've got a quote from you. The history of future cities is a chronicle of the hopes and dreams, horrors and anxieties of the time in which they were made. So in, in decades to come, when we look back at Planet City, um, uh, what is it telling us fundamentally about the, the moment we are in? Because it's, it's, not, all, it's not all bad news, but, but, but a lot of it is. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like that's it, it, it's it's what I'm talking about. There is this idea that that science fiction is never about prediction, right? It's about a way of looking back in on the present and and trying to um, create more more educated, informed people that are making decisions. Um, 1984 is 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 of course not about 1984. It's about 1948. The fact that we now currently live in a kind of Orwellian surveillance state um, is actually a sign that. Uh, you know, he didn't write uh, the fiction um, powerfully enough um, because in the end, um, we didn't act on his warning. Um, we didn't listen to the cautionary tale. He was writing about the sort of trends that he saw emerging at the time. If you don't stop what we're doing, this is where we're going to end up. And of course, here we are, um, uh, Facebooking, Zooming, um, Instagramming our lives um, uh, willingly to, uh, to the big brother of social media. Um, so hopefully, in 50 years' time, we're not looking back at Planet City going, oh, gee, um, uh, they really got it wrong, or, or gee, gee, they got it right. Um, maybe that's even worse. 
Um, but hopefully, you know, it's, it's a way of talking about the present moment where we all already are occupying a planetary scaled city. Um, uh, the, the, the current mode of urban existence is a planet wide urbanism um, that we're all citizens of. Um, it's an urbanism that has kind of slowly crept into existence through global scale logistics change and, and decades of extractive capitalism. Um, and what, if mm. anything, Planet City is trying to put a mirror up to that condition. And indeed, you're you're imagining a place um, which could be Melbourne or could be any city around the world where, where the city is also redesigned around other species as well. So that there's this sort of, um, I think this, idea of the the sort of dystopian vast urban terrain that we see in science fiction and some of these other speculative projects what you're um, imagining is something that's much more an ecology is that would that be um, true for you yeah i mean it, it's trying to imagine multi-species habitation of urban landscapes um but in a way that doesn't look like most visions do you know it's it's pink it's not green there's not trees on roofs there's there's um streets reformed as pink algae canals which are also the city's um high, pumped hydro storage battery systems um uh the 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 pink glow comes from the mixing of red and blue leds which creates the right kind of wavelength spectrums for for plants to photosynthesize in the absence of natural light um, so a lot of the, the landscape systems are kind of stacked and put together, um, but also it's filled with bird life that migrates up and down um, through the towers. It, it's of a density that generates its own kind of microclimates um, and its own um, uh, kind of constructed ecologies that we then kind of migrate with and move through as well. So we shift and, and occupy these urban conditions much more like we would do a landscape. Um, you know, the images we're seeing right now are from an area of the city we call the residential mountains. And we've been using a lot of these kind of l languages of landscape to describe the architecture of the city because it occurs at a scale where the traditional language of architecture falls apart and breaks down. Um, so the languages of, uh, and vocabulary of, of um, uh, terrain um, and landscape conditions become actually much more productive and useful than, you know, the vocabulary of um, modernism and architecture. So, um, yeah, it, it's 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 trying to imagine, um, you know, not human-centered design, but rather like weeping crane-centered design or carbon-centered design or um, uh, cloud-centered design. I don't know. Um, but certainly not putting us at the centre of things anymore. Mm. Liam, look, it's been fascinating talking to you. Um, I've, I, um, I've loved watching this project evolve and seeing how it's been received by the world. Um, I would encourage people to, um, to, uh, to, if you can, get a copy of Liam's Planet City book, which is a lovely little book, which goes with the film, which has the statistics and, and essays on, on the project. Um, Liam, thank you, and thank you for staying up so late or, or getting up so early. <laughs> have a good Oh, pleasure. Have a thanks, weekend. thanks, Ewan, for, for helping make the project a reality. You're such a huge part of it. It's great to talk to you about it again. All right. Thank you. See ya. And thank you, Ewan and Liam, for just sharing that incredibly compelling and reflective uh, conversation about this idea of world building really helping us to confront um, some of those really difficult questions. So uh, thank you to you both. Um, certainly during Open House Melbourne and beyond, you can see some uh, curated films that Liam himself has curated uh, in collaboration with Living Cities Forum and Open House Melbourne. It's at ACME in Cinema 3, so the online uh, platform at ACME. Now, our next speaker is uh, Nicole Carms, who is Associate Professor in the Faculty of Art, Design and Architecture. And she's a founding director of Monash University's XYX Lab. This lab is leading international research in gender and place. 
Nicole's going to talk about her work with the digital consultancy group CrowdSpot, as well as many other partners who have come together around this uh, incredible app called Your Ground. And this app crowdsources perceptions of safety in public space. We're going to start off with a screening of Your Ground and then Nicole will talk us through this uh, really uh, important project. Thanks, Fleur. Um, yes, and I, I'd just like to firstly acknowledge that I'm presenting from the lands of the Wadawurrung people. Uh, and yes, my name is Nicole Carms and I'm the director of the XYX lab at Monash University. So if we can go to the first slide, that would be terrific. Excellent. So Your Ground, as you've just heard, is a collaboration between the Monash University XYX lab and CrowdSpot. And the XYX lab is a research group that examines space and gender and identity through design practice. CrowdSpot is a digital consultancy specialising in map-based community engagement and data collection. And the aim of Your Ground is to crowdsource women and gender diverse people's perceptions of safety in public spaces across Victoria. So the project uh, is really focused on recreation and activity. Uh, and I thought it'd be useful just to kind of describe what I hope to discuss tonight. I'm really keen to think about how we can create more generous and equitable cities and communities. Um, I'm interested to think about how digital platforms can help shape multiple and diverse visions of cities and communities. And also to think about how we can reshape the future um, in terms of cities and suburbs and regional centres so that safety for women and girls and gender diverse people can be centralised in that thinking. So um, just in case you don't know, Your Ground is an interactive map. So it's accessed through a browser on your smartphone or indeed any device. And it allows people to anonymously drop a pin and tell their story and share an experience of their feelings of safety. And we'll talk more about this one um, within the presentation. Next slide. So I think it's really important to think about why cities should be gender sensitive. And research tells us that individual perceptions of safety in public space is really altered by gender. And this has very significant impacts on health and well-being. For many people, especially women and girls and gender diverse people, they're always changing their behaviour in their local communities. It's very complex and requires them to avoid certain places, to restrict their movement and to change their preferred patterns. Slide. So the Your Ground team, uh, we're expert in thinking about the relationship between placemaking and gender. And um, we're an interdisciplinary team of designers and planners and researchers. Um, and Anthony from CrowdSpot is a long-term collaborator of the XYX Lab. This is the fourth project that we've collaborated on together. Um, and we really deploy our skills across digital engagement, communication and urban placemaking into policy, to really think about how we can uh, surface the experiences of marginalised groups whose voices are not always heard and accounted for in urban placemaking. Next slide. Can we move to the next slide? So this project is a collaboration not only between XYX Lab and CrowdSpot, but also with some state partners, so Respect Victoria, as well as the Department of Environment, Land, Water and Planning, and then we've additionally partnered with 24 local government partners across inner, metro and regional Victoria. We have a range of allies, we have some ambassadors, and this really works together to make the project very cost effective. And there's an incredible and shared momentum and media engagement which happens when we kind of engage in this way. Next slide. So the key position about Your Ground is that designers and architects and urban planners and councillors all of us who work together to think about urban placemaking really need to think, think very carefully about the assumptions we make about women and gender diverse people's experiences in public spaces. And so this idea that we're uncovering the lived experiences of people who should presumably benefit from the work that we do in our local communities is really important. We are able, therefore, with your ground to provide insights that can help decision makers think more carefully about public spaces and make well-informed decisions um, and this hopefully makes cities more uh, accessible, inclusive and equitable. Next slide. 
the project has been designed to engage with women and gender diverse people. Uh, and the project is inclusive of all women, including cis women, trans women and intersex women. And the project has engaged with diverse sexual and gender identities as well. And when we were clocking how the project was progressing earlier this week, we had 14% of submissions were from people in the LGBTIQ community and 2% of overall submissions to date were from gender diverse people. So this is a really great um, data set that we're generating. Next slide. And the foundations of your ground are really based in the XYX Lab principles. So this idea of advocating for women and gender diverse people and to kind of include LGBTIQ in placemaking and thinking. Um, to think about co-design methods and how we can really use design to bring together different stakeholders when we're um, charged with making solutions. We're very interested in thinking about design as a mode of transformation. And what that means is not just thinking about design as being objects or buildings, but actually about how design can be deployed for purpose and problem solving and especially social issues. And of course, as a research lab based at a university, um, the Monash University XYX lab is absolutely dedicated to sharing this knowledge. Next slide. So I think it's also really useful to think about why cities are gendered. Um, and we, as I mentioned, people and women and girls and gender diverse people are often excluded, but we also need to think about the intersecting forms of that minoritisation. And the slide that you're seeing at the moment is really a kind of list of why women and gender diverse people exclude themselves from public space or how they manage being in public space. And so we can see that there are things about not going out at dark, um, not going out alone, avoiding particular places at particular times of the day, um, always carrying a phone, um, sometimes carrying a weapon. So these things are what uh, women and girls and gender diverse people are doing all the time. Next slide. And so we also have to think about the ways that gender is then intersecting with race and indigeneity, as well as ability and sexuality and age. And these are very complex combinations that often result in discrimination and means that some people are excluded from public spaces or even exclude themselves from public spaces because of the bad experiences that they have when they're out in their communities. Next slide. And so um, one of our colleagues at the XYX lab, Dr. Jill Mathewson, is really working very carefully to think about this idea of perceptions of safety. Uh, and this is a diagram that she's been developing from evidence-based research that really thinks about how there are aspects of perceptions of safety that influence public space. You can see from left to right that there are uh, individual issues that shape our perceptions of safety. There are the stories that come through media and television um, that are kind of the acculturation of thinking about gender. And then there's other people who might be occupying those spaces with us. And importantly, on the right, the kind of spatial conditions. And the spatial conditions are a key factor in how we're thinking about the work that we do at the XYX Lab, but also thinking about how they intersect with those more behavioural parts of the story. Next slide. And so part of what we also need to resist is this idea of neutrality in public space. We really think at the XYX Lab that we need to not just think about gender, as I've mentioned, but also those other intersecting aspects. But we also have to think about how when information is gathered, we can actually then code it through those intersecting elements. And this gives us a really rich and detailed data set. And what we're trying to resist is what um, uh, an author called Caroline Criado Perez describes as generic masculinity. And so with the Your Ground data, what we can do is start to arm urban planners and designers with a kind of intersectional awareness and competency around how we can make inclusive spaces. So without kind of gender sensitive data, what tends to happen is that planners and designers and policymakers will defer to what is described as a default user. And that means that they're continuing to reproduce dominant stereotypes, that their perspective is generally biased towards what is probably going to be a white and hetero and male and able-bodied and probably English speaking user. And we really have to think about how we can challenge neutrality. Um, we see it as a key and critical obstacle for governments and organisations and institutions when we're thinking about urban design and placemaking. So next slide. So this is what the map looks like. As I mentioned, it's a digital map where participants um, move through the map to drop a pin on local streets or parks or trails or recreational spaces. Um, and as I also mentioned, it's across metro, suburban and regional Victoria. 
the idea is, is that you're sharing an experience, you're telling a story about your safe and unsafe experiences. And I think the particular innovation of this project uh, and the work that we do with CrowdSpot is the way that we can gather this information in the user's own time. And it also catches what's generally missed from the traditional justice system or things like police reports or other data that communities might have. So it's really filling a gap in that sense. Next slide. It's not a project that's up forever. So the project was launched on the 20th of April and it will run until the end of July. So you need to get in quick and think about sharing your story. But after the engagement period ends, what happens is we are analysing and coding all of the data to produce a range of insights and reports for our partners. Let's see if this um, animation on the next slide will work. So what you can see here is just an animation of what it's like to drop a pin. It's geolocative. You tell a story about the safe or unsafe spot. You are able to describe what kind of environment it is, the kind of activity you're undertaking, and the impact um, on your experience. And there's lots of um, intersecting factors that we're gathering uh, around um, identity, but also around the kinds of spaces. Next slide. With the work that we do at the XYX Lab, we're absolutely maniac about kind of thinking about brand identity and engagement is such a huge part of this project. So the logo and the brand identity was designed by my co-director, Jean Borden, and it brings together representations of diversity and accuracy and data. Next slide. It works across a range of devices. So um, dropping a pin and sharing a story can happen on your phone or on your computer. Next slide. And the marketing and communications of this project is a, uh, a machine. Um, the aim, of course, is to drive engagement to the map. So essentially, the relationship between CrowdSpot and XYX Lab um, is then about feeding media and collateral to the LGAs, and that can be um, communication campaigns, the kind of social media, the posters, the explainer video like you just saw, and then they drive that out through their own social media channels and all of their own communities. So there's a real raft of information that everyone is benefit, benefiting from um, across Victoria while we're kind of building the attraction and engagement with the map. Um, and just to kind of let you know that um, at the moment we have over 5,500 contributions, which is fantastic. And the, really the power of the project is being able to gather qualitative and, quali and quantitative data and engage at that community level. You can see here that there's a range of social media um, Isabella Webb from our team at XYX Lab developed these kinds of uh, approaches to identity and messaging and graphics and the instructional aspects and the personal narrative. So there's a really um, big sense of how design is working at lots of different levels. Next slide. The media engagement is a huge part of the project. Um, in the first week, I think we had 52 media reports across uh, newspapers, television and radio. And these range from calls to action to local angles where the communities are kind of um, asking people to think about their own experiences. Uh, it, it involves advocacy roles and spokespeople speaking to their lived experience. We also had the AFLW players Darcy Vescio and Izzy Huntington really amplify the messages of this campaign and, as I say, to drive engagement with the map. Next slide. Importantly, in this project, we really wanted to reach communities that may um, be missed from being able to engage and participate in this project. So we um, translated the uh, communication materials into seven languages, which were the kind of top languages across the LGAs that we were working with. And so this meant there were communications in Mandarin, Cantonese, Arabic, Vietnamese, Hindi, Greek and Italian. Next slide. And so, um, unsurprisingly, we're uncovering that women and gender diverse people remain vigilant when they're out recreating and exercising um, in public spaces. We're also finding in the preliminary results that there's just a significant link between health and wellbeing and access to recreational space. And during lockdowns, during restrictions, this is really important and this is being commented on within the, the data set already. Other early findings indicate that the feelings of being unsafe really do kind of create a change in behaviour that women and gender diverse people are changing their daily routines and it, it affects their impact and, and the capacity, I should say, to enjoy public parks. 
On a positive note, one of the things that is happening is that people are sharing some positive experiences, which actually indicate that upgrades and investments in public space are making a difference, which is also great feedback for local councils and communities. And what you can see here is just what we're kind of getting towards with the insights and outputs. Um, we're uh, having large data sets and heat maps and interactive maps and visualisations of the research, as well as um, a range of reports. And what I can tell you is that the outcomes will not have a kind of one size fits all approach. Um, we need to really think about how we can engage with diversity if we're going to make actual and effectual change. So um, the insight driven approaches will help shape women and girls experiences of Victoria. It will also help shape uh, gender diverse people's experiences in the future to provide uh, councils with this data will really impact the gender equality uh, and equity that we're seeing in our local communities. Next slide. So if you have any questions, please do um, send them through to the XYX Lab and follow us on all the different social media channels, including your ground map, um, and drop a pin and share your story if you're able to. It would be terrific to have some more insights. And the final slide. Thank you, Fleur. Thanks no, uh, so much, Nicole, um, for sharing this incredible project. And if you want to know a little bit more about your ground, uh, as uh, Nicole said, you can reach out direct. There's also a video on the Open House uh, Weekend site. And once restrictions allow, uh, Nicole and her team have also uh, put together some guided walks. Um, so sign up for our newsletter and we can keep you informed of when they'll be as soon as restrictions allow us to do that. So our next speakers are talking about a very special project that I mentioned earlier uh, called Building Pride. We have Justine Della Riva, who is the inaugural CEO of the Victorian Pride Centre in St Kilda, uh, along with James Brearley of BAU Architecture or Brearley Architecture and Urban Design who with Grant Amon uh, designed the building. Um, we are going to start off with a short film from a documentary, uh, also entitled Building Pride and produced by Toby and Sam Reed. Then we're going to hear from Justine and James. Um, so over to the video. It is a manifestation of pride. And people may wonder why pride is so important to our community. Um, and pride is important because all of us, almost without exception, grow up from an early age with a sense of being different or not good enough, whatever that might be, or later on treatment by family, community and, 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 and more broadly. Uh, but with that notion of shame, it's very corrosive of the spirit and be, can be crippling. And the only way through that is a personal journey towards pride, because pride is the opposite of shame. Design ideas came out of um, trying to be very, uh, very social, you know, making the place a real um, meeting place, a real welcoming meeting place for the community. And, um, and also out of being very um, St Kilda and sensuous. And, uh, you know, the first sketches were, were all about, you know, St Kilda's arches. Well, we pushed them out to be, um, you know, spheres. We, we wondered if we could make the place, you know, more obviously, um, you know, breaking architectural rules. And so, you know, the building became a bubble box in, for a little while. And, um, you know, Jens and the team tried to make that into a, a building, um, you know, sort of structurally based on a car park grid, but it became virtually, um, virtually impossible. We came back and looked at structural grids and we sort of made each of the structural bays a bubble. We tried to put the bubbles together, um, inspired by some work in a book called Sightless that um, has always been a great... <laughs> joy to have a look at. We couldn't get the bubbles to work. Um, by this time our contextual feedback was telling us that 
St Kilda is full of this sort of Moorish, delightful, romantic architecture. It's, um, there's arches and barrel vaults and, um, and domes and so on there. And we um, looked at this idea of extruding a series of barrel vaults through the building, still keeping these fairly soft, abstract forms, but rationalising it in a very you know, profound way. The egg came in very early from our point of view as a sort of looking at the planning and resolving the brief. So we had, the egg was always um, a pivot point in the building and it was the central core. We're delighted with the design because it does fulfill the brief which was about having a home that our community, the LGBTI community, could be proud of, uh, a place for celebration, and also a safe and sustainable home for the community. Good evening, everyone. Um, it's always very moving to listen to board member Peter McEwen uh, speak about the Pride Centre. Uh, as a person who uh, grew up with uh, a great deal of shame uh, in a time where homosexuality uh, was a crime. Um, firstly, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the people, the Wurundjeri people and the Boonarong people uh, of the Kulin Nations, uh, whose lands we're meeting on tonight, uh, and pay my respects to their elders past and present. Uh, slide one, I'll ask the, the team to, to pop up. Um, the Victorian Pride Centre is built on the lands of the Boonarong people, uh, and our journey with the traditional owners has been an important part of the design as well. Uh, slide two, please. Um, I'd like to particularly thank Nawit, uh, Dr. Carolyn Briggs and Koori Pride Victoria and the Boonarong mob uh, who have helped guide myself uh, as well as the members of the Victorian Pride Centre on our journey to recognising and understanding what it is to welcome others. Uh, you'll see in this image here uh, that uh, in the entrance of the Pride Centre, uh, underneath, we uh, mark the words, Woman Dijika, come with purpose to our beautiful home. Uh, slide three, please. Uh, and our home, the Victorian Pride Centre, is beautiful. It is meaningful and iconic. It has a very important purpose. Uh, it's a, a place of belonging, support, uh, and pride for the diverse lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, gender diverse, non-binary, intersex and queer communities, the LGBTIQ plus communities. Uh, and it's not only a place of welcome, but of connection. As Australia's first purpose-built Pride Centre, this is where everyone can come together, honour the past, celebrate the present, uh, and work towards a more inclusive future. And I want to recognise the previous speaker, Nicole, uh, and the work that they're doing, uh, which really is very much about creating that inclusive space. Uh, and so just wanting to call out that that's uh, amazing work that they're doing. Um, the centre is a home to important LGBTIQ organisations, engaging cultural programs, vital health services and inspiring social spaces. The Pride Centre is a place for community and a place of pride. The theme of... Oh, hi. Um, sorry, we've lost. All right. Hi, everyone. 
I'll present some thoughts around one of the central objectives of the brief, and that was to create a place of deep welcoming and safety to the Pride community. Um, so we might have a slide coming up. <clears throat> um, next slide. Uh, firstly, uh, hats off to the um, Pride Board for having the courage and vision to have a virtually open design competition, something that's become incredibly rare in conservative Melbourne today. Um, we titled the project Building the Unfinished because the organisation itself is you know, in a state of becoming. And we wanted the building to, to have a sense of, um, of potential, um, not potential acted out. Um, next slide, thanks. <clears throat> um, like the Victorian Trades Hall, uh, this building deserves to be a, a, a monument, a monument to equality. And um, more importantly, it's a, a place to drive further change. The, um, the Pride communities are diverse, but something they've got in common is, is um, a century of belonging to St Kilda. And um, there's many reasons for this. You know, it's because of the... Uh, economic, the, the social, the environmental, even the spatial conditions in St Kilda, they're very unique. <clears throat> so we, we figured that if we could try to capture the spirit of place in the building, pardon me, that we might get some way towards make, making this very welcoming building. Some of the building, some of the paintings of Sidney Nolan uh, capture this spirit of place. Um, the big dance halls, uh, a mass gathering along the beachside um, were places where a lot of diversity was born in St Kilda. Uh, Nolan's paintings of the, um, of the beach capture this amazing um, superimposition of activities and lives and, and cultures. Um, of course, St Kilda is a place of the, um, of the beach, of the sensuous, a, a place where um, the baths were initiated and they were, you know, men owned and women only <clears throat> until not that long ago um, and mostly naked inside. But um, this tradition still continues in, in Melbourne. It's, um, it's a place of great um, exotic architecture that comes along with all of this sort of otherness, this, these other activities. The work of local architect Alan Powell captures this the unravelling of 19th century sort of um, mansion suburb St Kilda. This, this is when the mansions were divided up and um, it, it, it enabled the suburb to include a lot of, a lot of other people. Um, and it's sort of where the light gets in. This is um, Alan Powell dragging up to up Fitzroy Street some sort of beached um, uh, jetty jetty columns, you know, very poetic gesture and suggestion, suggesting that this great, great boulevard be, be more civic than it is. Um, this is just down from the Pride Centre. <clears throat> and um, ARM's um, surrealist billboard uh, facade on the face apartments, extending, you know, the, the realm of Luna Park's suspended disbelief and um, other other buildings in St Kilda, such as, um, you know, Leo's <clears throat> famous night spaghetti bar and its pop graphic uh, giant letter facade. So all of these influences we tried to um, bring to the, the project in the hope that, you know, this, you know, the collective consciousness or the collective memory might, might um, bring out this sense of belonging. Um, experiments with spheres, as you heard, became difficult. I mean, spheres are, are by nature a very closed geometry. <clears throat> so when we started experimenting with tubes, we, we very quickly realised that tubes, tubes are the, the architecture of connection. Um, of course, pipes. And they, they could connect um, tenancies within the building. They could connect to the street. And as we um, shaped the building to the town planning envelope and removed parts of it to get you know, open air on the roofs and space for trees to grow. We scalloped the back facade to allow to save the big peppercorn trees. So what, what results is this sort of fragmented abstraction of the original bundle of tubes. And 
um, a sense of other orders coexisting in the building. And we wanted to create a, uh, a, a real heart to the building. The brief called for a sort of a town square. We made that a vertical sort of town square. We removed this ellipsoid shape from the, from the tubes. <clears throat> and the virtual tubes pass through the ellipsoid and, and create you know, something like a Gordon Matter clark sort of cutting, only it's curved through curve. So the resultant um, shapes and forms are very sensuous and very unpredictable. You know, it's a great surprise to us. You know, it's a sort of a, a design of, of emergence. Um, so here you can see um, you can see that tube right through to the front facade where the window is evident, and um, this this is that great social gathering space, <clears throat> the Thunderdome of the building. The building's in uh, a sort of bleached, weathered white concrete, and you can get a sense of the layering on the on the roofs, which will become overgrown with trees. A sort of a, a Pyrenaean space sense that Cool House talks about. Um, so the building's uh, tubes are very, uh, very large at ground level, very welcoming into the building, um, and they start to reflect um, other, other grand public openings around St Kilda, such as the familiar Mr Moon's threshold. Uh, the ground floor plan, uh, the front half is basically a big working space. The, uh, the back half is a, an event space spilling out onto a half-sunken um, courtyard. There's a bookshop in the middle and a cafe up the front. You'll see in the section the, um, the ellipsoid that connects the whole building, all of the tenancies, you know, pass one another around this space. All of the elevators and stairs are focused here. Um, in the building, you'll see this um, robust uh, concrete armature marching through the building. That's that's on the structural grid. They're all structural columns. These blades, and the keystones are uh, active beams. Um, and the uh, the vaults or the um, the tubes are, are carved out in various ways for various pragmatic um, um, concerns. And they start to to again, you know, present the the building building the unfinished or other orders coexisting in the building. And you'll get a sense that the building's very robust. Um, it's a great sort of workshop space. Uh, it's nothing too precious about it. It was a mix of the very precious and the very and the very rough, so people are free to, to come in and do projects. The front wall is a garage door that slides up, so all scales can happen there. This is the opening um, uh, ceremonies uh, last week and the centre of the building acting as a stage and a, and a stage set. And it's like a theatre in the round with proscenium arches on, of many shapes uh, wrapping around it. That's Dolly Diamond um, emceeing the night. Uh, this is the multifunction space with a, a meeting room balcony up on the left there and some markings of contours of country uh, representing the pre-existing slope on the land. We worked with... Uh, Jarrah Steele um, of the um, local Yellowcoot Willem clan, the Boon Warong people, um, to get a, a raft of um, initiatives that we hope to play out in the building over the next year or so <clears throat> with various artists. Um, one of which is uh, the Indigenous pillars, which are align very much with the philosophies of the Pride Centre. Um, and uh, other ideas of um, using indigenous local language to, to name places throughout the building, to engrave into the concrete in subtle places, and also um, some acknowledgement of um, the previous uh, Munro's on the site, which was uh, the meeting place of the Transgender Victoria Group, Seahorse Club, only here uh, reflected in the indigenous um, um, uh, seahorse, the, um, what's it called, the um, dragon, the, uh, oh, I can't remember the name, but no. Um, the floor above this is the um, smaller tenancies, and we've arranged them with their own potential sort of identities. They're shaking around there in plan. 
Um, we've designed them like a sort of a, a marketplace of ideas, of, of shop fronts, and we've designed sort of sacrificial um, timber framing layer so that, you know, they can express themselves. All the tenants can have their own expression on their own facade. So this is prior to occupation um, with some of the donated furniture that um, the centre is so reliant on <clears throat> and so thankful to have. Um, one of the many meeting rooms, it's largely a conference centre for all sorts of organisations inside and outside. Uh, one of the private tenancies doing their own fit out, Star Health on second floor. Um, <clears throat> more around the central meeting space, bringing light into the heart of the very deep building. The kit of parts. So this section reveals more cutting of the tubes and, you know, revealing of that kind of Moorish spirit of, of St Kilda, that very exotic stuff. Um, just fl flirting around the outside of the building here, looking down on the, the vaults, which when carved start to, to look a bit like the waves down at um, St Kilda Beach, which was a, a surprise to us. But, but again, more about this this spirit of, of place coming out and Inga King, you know, capitalising on that in a bigger, bolder way, which we should have noticed when we were doing it. Um, this is the event space on the, the rooftop. The top floor with a variety of smaller tenancies, Monash Trans, the rooftop, um, with bar and this space is where we're developing a community garden with a big community consultation group. Again, moving around the building to the side, referencing one of the 70s towers on the beachfront, those windows, as well as Melnikov. And Nolan here reminding us that St Kilda is very much of the night. It's a, a, a place of, of privacy, of meetings, of queer space. The back of our building is um, clad in uh, black metal. It's very different to the front. Around these peppercorn trees we saved is a, a little plaza, and this ties into the network of back streets and back lanes around this district. So we've attempted to make a monument to equality and inclusiveness. Um, an adaptable workshop and from which to campaign and drive further change. Um, and we've attempted to make a deeply welcoming place to the Rainbow community. And in good part, this has been from uh, learning from St Kilda. So, I think it I think it might be over to me now, James, uh, and I do apologise for, for um, uh, falling out. And James, uh, I think uh, he, of course, as our uh, amazing architect of the Pride Centre, has, has really covered um, uh, 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 all of what is significant about what's being created. So I, I won't take up much, too much time further than and then where I left off um, was to you know to to really point out that that the Pride Centre um, is about creating a, a place of belonging um, and that part of the impetus uh, behind the creation of the Pride Centre um, was to create a sustainable home for those LGBTIQ organisations who are often faced with uncertain uh, funding and future. Uh, the Victorian Pride Centre Limited isn't a peak organisation. We don't represent the LGBTIQ sector. Uh, we are on one hand a landlord and on the other a facilitator and amplifier, um, a, a, a pathway that facilitates and grows the communities. Um, we catalyse and complement uh, we have laid the cornerstone on which we will support and build the capacity of those organisations and individuals working together in the centre. 
uh, and how we do work together, how do we bring diverse groups in under one roof um, by recognising, I suppose, that our success is based on their success, that one size does not fit all and that for some organisations, uh, an area or a storage space in the basement of the centre is more critical than a, than a view over the city uh, and that for them to meet their aims and objectives, you need to create flexible spaces and flexible agreements. Um, most importantly, you need to take them on the journey from the very beginning. Um, so here we see uh, Jude Munro, the uh, chair of the Pride Centre, um, taking a sledgehammer with members uh, of our resident organisations, members of the boards and uh, uh, and management, uh, knocking down Munro's restaurant and Munro's restaurant, as some of you some of you may or may not know, uh, was a restaurant on Fitzroy Street. That in the late 70s, 80s, and 90s, members of the trans and gender diverse community um, would come in the back door through Jackson Street to meet together, but to meet in safety. Uh, and what we're creating on, um, uh, on the site of, of Munro's uh, is again another place of safety, of safety and inclusion, um, uh, and to do it together. Uh, so if we go through, this is our cornerstone, the next slide uh, reflects all of the different resident organisations uh, and as I said, you need to take them on the journey. They have to be there at the beginning, um, they have to be there, next slide please, uh, when you top out at the, at the end and then of course when you open the doors uh, uh, and celebrate the fact that uh, as a community, a community that's uh, suffered discrimination, um, uh, been st uh, stigmatised, uh, that together you can create an amazing space. Um, the Victorian Pride Centre, as James mentioned, houses uh, 14 permanent resident organisations, all with differing footprints. Uh, we're creating a home and a place of belonging uh, it requires a whole village and our future role uh, is to ensure that the resident organisations are well supported to deliver the full range of important health, social and cultural services to our community. Um, we must be more, as I said, than a landlord. Uh, we must also be an activator. Uh, next slide, please. Um, uh, we want the building to be a dynamic and vibrant hub of activity. One of the architectural principles, as James mentioned, of the building is to create a place for connection and celebration, the joining of people and conversations. Activation means ensuring that the centre is used from morning till evening all year round, spaces that can be transformed, uh, a multi-purpose theatrette that can host a mediation Oh, sorry, a meditation group in the morning, a roundtable discussion uh, during the day and a cabaret performance at night, a gallery space that promotes queer artists, a rooftop with a view that makes every individual who steps out uh, onto the top makes them feel like they're on top of the world, co-working desks, meeting rooms and virtual office services that bring in non-permanent groups and organisations and allies and individuals into the space so that they can also feel a sense of permanency and benefit from the infrastructure created and the connection to community. Um, there is still much to be done uh, and this centre is here for generations who have not even been born yet with struggles uh, we aren't even aware of. Um, we've only just begun on our journey of activation on learning to work together in this space. I've spent most of my life a little bit like Peter at the beginning, um, living with a sense of shame, a sense of uh, that I was not quite right and that there was something wrong with me. Um, this place makes an unequivocal statement about the self-worth and the value of LGBTIQ people. It makes uh, me... Uh, feel a sense of pride and it's a statement that all Victorians should also feel proud of. So to welcoming you through the doors of the Australia's first purpose-built LGBTIQ Pride Centre at 79 Fitzroy Street. 
Um, and thank you very much for the opportunity uh, to speak about this amazing and iconic uh, statement of pride. Thanks, Fleur. Thanks so much, Justine. I'm, I'm so glad we managed to get you back on the line. Thank you for sharing so generously um, that incredible pathway and journey of, of making this building together with your community and also with the architects. Thank you, James, for uh, revealing the process to us. Um, I do want to remind you that there is a Facebook Live uh, tomorrow at 2 o'clock uh, with Justine and her team at the Pride Centre. So um, there will be lots more conversations to be had. So uh, log on to our website for that. Um, it's my great pleasure now to welcome our next speakers. Uh, who uh, we have three speakers in conversation together. We have Boda Bell, who is the Vice Chancellor's Indigenous Pre-Doctoral Fellow at RMIT University. And Bo will be in conversation with Dr. Christine Phillips and Jock Gilbert of RMIT Architecture and Urban Design. And together, they're going to explore what Melbourne might look like in the future if we embrace design, when we embrace design, as an act of reconciliation. So over to you, uh, Christine. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I would like to take a moment uh... Actually, firstly, just to say that my name's Bo, not Christine, uh, but I would also like to take a moment to explain the purpose of an acknowledgement of country and why it's different to Arnie Caroline's welcome. Uh, because I'm not from this land, speaking virtually as if I am in Melbourne, uh, I can't welcome you to here. Uh, I can't welcome you here, it's, it's not my place. Uh, but I would like to give my acknowledgement of country uh, and just want you to understand a, a simple philosophy first. So the dreaming or dream time as a term is actually a misinterpretation of an early conversation between Francis Gillian uh, and the Aranda people he was speaking with near Alice Springs. Uh, and what I understand was trying to be explained was the Aranda word Alkringa. Uh, my father Alkringa, his father Alkringa, his father Alkringa, everyone. Alkringa. And the philosophy behind this simple explanation was the all time, uh, an eternal past and an eternal future, or it's been, as it has been taught to me, the story or spirit of the land. Uh, the story of the land is what an acknowledgement of country shares with the people who are present. Uh, it recognises our place in an eternal story on a land that we recognise as sharing with those who have stood here before us. An acknowledgement of country is not about ownership, we as Aboriginal people understand that we're no different to the country that we stand on. Uh, we don't own it, but each of us owns our own story. And at this moment, with this land that we stand on, in the story of all time, our story is one. We share this moment with the Aboriginal caretakers of this land story, the elders who have stood here before us and those who have not stood here yet. We are connected to each other in this moment through the story of the land. Uh, like I said, my name is Bo and I'm a proud Camilleroy man. And tonight we're just going to have a brief chat uh, about what Melbourne will look like in the future uh, when we embrace design as an act of reconciliation. Uh, to, to reconcile something is to restore union and friendship after an estrangement. Uh, but what are, what are we re reconciling and, and why? Uh, so in the short time I have tonight, I'm just going to skip to a key word, which is displacement. Uh, and this displacement is from country, from family and from culture and from the city. So this displacement's created an absence of Indigenous cultures within cities. I mean, you, you walk through the city and an Aboriginal presence is, is missing. Uh, it's 65,000 years of continuous occupation. Uh, and in 250 years, virtually all pre Aboriginal presence is gone. Uh, and how do we begin to reconcile this atrocity? Sorry, can I get the first slide up, which is the acknowledgement? Sorry. Uh, so, uh, so actually, we are, so how do we begin to reconcile this atrocity? Uh, we can reconnect Aboriginal occupation through the visibility of the built environment and the cityscape. Uh, 
and this is how we're pro proposing to move forward when we embrace design as an act of reconciliation. Uh, but visibility is only half the act. Uh, the voices of the people need to be heard and incorporated within, design, within the entire design conversation, embedding a cultural presence and authenticity into each project. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, in a recently completed project for the University of Newcastle, uh, the design brief uh, wanted to highlight pre and post colonial history of the site. Uh, so we worked through pre colonial history of the foreshore, including the Awabakal stories and their occupation of the land. Uh, we looked through early cartography maps and saw the drastic changes since colonisation. Uh, and much more research showed where developments in the local area had actually disturbed various middens, which are uh, collections of shell and bone, um, you know, proving uh, the occupation of site by the Awabakal people in this instance. Uh, slide, please. In this reference, uh, we, sorry, in this example, I'm actually referencing nearby middens uh, from the Aboriginal occupation of the area. Uh, and these have been disturbed throughout the development of the foreshore. Um, but where this site sit is, sits is actually over um, the post-colonial change of the shoreline. So we didn't expect to find any uh, middens in the area, but we did want to reclaim any shell that was found uh, and redistribute it through the shab, the, the slab. Uh, and the coal darkened sand of that foreshore area uh, really references the geology of the site as well. So by combining these elements, we developed this artificial midden within the ground floor level, uh, bringing a subtle yet important indigenous presence into this city. Uh, which is Newcastle. Uh, and, and this is how I begin to see the emergence of recognising country in an, and an Aboriginal presence to the city within a contemporary architectural context. Uh, these types of projects that, that do bring an Indigenous presence, presence back to the city are uh, facilitated by practitioners like Jeff Greenaway, who we're going to hear from, uh, or artists like Rico Rennie, uh, but also in the education of our future Indigenous and non-Indigenous practitioners. Uh, both Jock and Christine are going to walk you through some of the ways in which RMIT and both uh, Jock and Christine are giving an Indigenous presence to the curriculum by educating our future practitioners. And I will call over to you, Jock. Thank you, Bo. Uh, what a fantastic exploration of what country is in relation to story and the acknowledgement and back to the welcome. Um, could I have the next slide, please? Thank you. So I'm a non-Indigenous landscape architect uh, and I'm an academic. I have an academic practice at RMIT. And I'd also like to acknowledge the people of the Woiwurrung and Boonwurrung language groups of the Eastern Kulin Nations on whose unceded lands we do now know that we conduct the business of the university. I'd also like to acknowledge the Wadawurrung people on whose land I live and the people of the Barkindji Nation and particularly the Culpra Millie Aboriginal Corporation through whose continuing generosity I continue to learn an enormous amount. I also respectfully acknowledge all the ancestors and elders, pastors, past, present and emerging and also all of the Aboriginal people here in the room and those who are joining us in the digital room, especially uh, Bo, thank you very much. And uh, also a big shout out to G for Greenaway who will be up next and whose work has been absolutely instrumental in guiding our journey. And of course that of the design profession more broadly. And I'd also like to, to call out and acknowledge Nawi Auntie Carolyn Briggs uh, for her particular way of guiding us. It was through Nawi's welcome and the expression of Womanjika that I came to understand that as a non-Indigenous design practitioner and academic, that I was being invited through the welcome into a relationship with a knowledge and knowledge system that isn't mine, but that I in turn had obligations to that knowledge and to the holders of that knowledge, and that I must take responsibility for meeting those obligations. So I can now finally state in response, in acknowledgement of the welcome and Womanjika, that it is my purpose, my intent, 
through the work to meet those obligations and in doing so engage in and through a practice of reconciliation. And that I think is the, the purpose of um, what we're about tonight uh, in order to share that. So the question is how do we do reconciliation as non-Indigenous designers? In the School of Architecture and Urban Design at RMIT, we see reconciliation as an, as an everyday practice embedded in place. It's a, pl a practice built through a relationship to place and our relationship to place then necessarily depends on our relationships to the knowledge and the knowledge holders specific to our place. So our academic engagements always start with relationships and as always in relationships, the relationship itself is privileged over the outcome. So events become opportunities for relationship building. Events like this one on the screen, Brooke Andrews Representation, Remembrance and Memorial Project, through which First Nations and non-Indigenous design professionals were invited to come together in the university with traditional owners and knowledge holders to consider how memorials to the frontier wars are designed, can be designed, and what impact they have within the cities that they're built. We also ensure that, oh sorry, next slide please. We also ensure that students go out of the academy, undertaking trips to visit communities without the pressure of assessment, solely doing the business of relationship building. And these are a couple of images of student trips to Wilcannia and Mutawinchi National Park in Western New South Wales, coming to grips with both the lived reality of contemporary Indigenous life and the kind of sense of awe and wonder that exists in those landscapes in relation to story and country. Can I have the next slide, please? Thank you. Out of these relationships, which are fostered through these events and trips, arise opportunities for teaching and learning projects. So the opportunities then, these opportunities then in turn enrich relationships in a reciprocal learning environment. This is a design studio undertaken on country with the Culpra Millie Aboriginal Corporation at Culpra Station in southern New South Wales. And it's indicative of a series of, of design studios that we've run since 2014, which seek to develop uh, enterprise opportunities with the community on that property. Thank you. Then in turn, opportunities for research arise out of these relationships and events, often the teaching and learning events. Research which must of course afford Aboriginal people authorship of their knowledge and then sharing that in ways that enrich an understanding of place and our relationship to that place. These can be practical, sometimes helping to establish and support enterprises or providing platforms for Aboriginal knowledges, but always they're underpinned by principles of reciprocity and respect for cultural integrity. Next slide, thank you. Being invited into significant events is a great privilege. And the next slide, thank you. These are images from the return to country of Mungo Man at Lake Mungo, the ceremony which we were invited to several years ago. And they also speak to the importance of very small, everyday, often overlooked aspects of life. These are uh, little points that can be easily overlooked, but which also hold enormous significance. So learning to cook, to share and enjoy Johnny Cakes, telling stories, following Uncle Barry Pierce's traditional recipe and guidance, all provide ways into relationships and relationships with knowledge. Now these images don't, sorry, one back. Thank you. Uh, now these images don't look too much like the city, but it's worth considering a couple of things in that relationship. It's often, as Bo has said, and Auntie Carolyn often says, it's often easier to recognise places outside the city as legible markers of Aboriginal knowledge and sovereignty. So the question is, why is that? And how can we ensure that the forms, the programs, the places of our cities begin to more powerfully reflect the sovereignty of our First Peoples? We, as non-Indigenous people, understand now that we are always on country. We're part of country and the city must reflect that. As non-Indigenous design professionals, how do we understand our place? 
how do we ensure that relationships with Aboriginal knowledge and knowledge holders are embedded in and inform everything we do? Okay, well, we'll need to let Christine have a minute too, but this is where Jock finishes. In order to engage with Bill Gamage's prompt in his book, The Biggest Estate on Earth, we have a continent to learn. If we are to survive, let alone feel at home, we must begin to understand our country. If we succeed, one day we might become an Australian. We might become Australian. And this, we say, can only be done through the practice of reconciliation in a very powerful way. Thank you. And I'll hand on now to Christine, who will provide some more examples and bring it back to the city. Thanks, Christine. Thank you, Bo and Jock. Momenjika, my name is Christine Phillips, Madam Big Christine Phillips. I'm a non-Indigenous architect currently working full-time at RMIT in the architecture program. And I welcome you all from my home in St Kilda, just down the road from that very beautiful new Pride Centre that we just saw. On the unceded lands, the Bic of the Yellowcut Willem on Bunurong country, and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. In particular, to Nawit, Carolyn Briggs, who's been a great and ongoing mentor for me and who welcomed us all here this evening, along with Uncle Leonard Clark, who has welcomed me and many of our architecture students into his community over the last few years. So as a non-Indigenous architect, I continuously reflect on what it means to design, work and live on these unceded lands. This is my purpose. What does it mean to design on land that has over 65,000 years of culture and knowledge embedded within it? And how do we reconnect and connect meaningfully with country? So as an educator at RMIT, and thank you for swapping over that slide, I invite our students to also actively engage with these questions so that we can all work towards a future architecture in Australia that not only celebrates Indigenous knowledge and culture, learns from Indigenous knowledge and culture, but it is also co-designed with our First Nations people. And this has been a pretty big, steep learning curve for me. I got the same rotten, rotten education that most people of my generation got at school when it comes to Indigenous culture, knowledge and people. And I must thank Indigenous architects Jeefa Greenaway and Carol Gosam for guiding me through this, along with my colleagues Jock Gilbert and Bo de Bell, as well as the great work of Paul Mimmet. And I also thank my co-teacher Stasinos Mansis, who's been on this journey with me from the beginning. So one of the first lessons that I have learnt is that we need to tackle these issues in a way that is different from how we would normally work as architects and indeed as academics. I've had to do a bit of brain dewiring throughout this process. And what I've learnt is that rather than begin with a project, we need the project to evolve out of the relationships we build with our First Nations people as Jock alluded to earlier. Here we see Uncle Leonard Clark, a highly respected Krewarong elder, who has been working with our architecture students for three years now on a vision he has to build a world-class music, cultural and education centre on his family's Aboriginal owned land in the Western District of Victoria. And this is a centre that he wants to not only celebrate the talents of his people, but also to support Aboriginal sovereignty and self-determination, and most importantly, also tackle the ongoing problem of the over-incarceration of our First Nations people in Australia. And as an elder that has worked for the Koori Court for many years, and also with a grandson that's currently in prison, he has a lot of first-hand knowledge into this problem. And one of the things he tells our students is that his late father, Uncle Banjo Clark, used to say, jail is the university of crime. So Uncle Lenny wants to provide cultural and education opportunities for young Aboriginal people as a crime prevention, but also to welcome and celebrate all Australians to this beautiful new centre. And so our students have been working 
with Uncle Lenny to begin to design what this centre might look like in a way that celebrates Cray Rowan culture, but also celebrates, supports Aboriginal sovereignty and self-determination. This is a project that's been driven and led by Uncle Lenny and what our architecture students can bring to this relationship is an ability to visualise what such a centre might look like. It's not about me as the architect coming up with an idea and then inviting Indigenous communities to participate in that project. It needs to work the other way around. This is a, no, just back one, sorry. Thank you. This is a semester long design subject that includes a three day field trip where students learn directly on Crayworong country, where the students not only get to understand the site in a very intimate way, but where they experience and participate in a number of cultural activities, along with learn directly from Uncle Lenny and the community through more informal activities like yarning around the fire, cooking, walking and talking with members of the community on their field trips. They then take that knowledge back to RMIT, continue, continue to develop their designs, and then we invite Uncle Lenny and his son Cray back to RMIT, where the students present their designs to them, and where these designs can then be used for the community to present to future stakeholders. Next slide, please. But as Jock and Bo mentioned earlier, it's very important for our students to understand that working on country does not just happen within regional and remote communities, but that country in that indigenous sense of the word is everywhere. We are all on country all of the time in Australia. So we also run a design studio partnered with very well-known Bunbodong elder Nawit, Dr. Carolyn Briggs AM, who welcomed us all this evening on a vision she has for our city to build a First Nations assembly and cultural building within the heart of our arts precinct in Melbourne. Nawit has been a great mentor for me and for the students, sharing on her knowledge about Bunwurong culture and language and how this might inform a new kind of tower building within our city. One that celebrates Indigenous knowledge for all of Australians, but also a place that is welcoming for our First Nations people. So we're currently working on that this semester. And now we would like to finish with a clip from some words from Uncle Lenny that speaks to the importance of these relationships. Thank you. Without RMIT's involvement, a lot of these dreams that we have of putting out to the public of the positive side of Aboriginal people would not be happening without without their, their involvement. And I'll tell you what, I'm really appreciative of RMIT getting involved. Thank you so much, um, Bo, Christine and Jock. Thank you for sharing how you're teaching together and learning together and working with uh, your students and to hear more about Bo's research as well. Um, and I would also just give everyone a heads up that we will be doing a conversation called Designing on Country. Unfortunately, it had to be postponed at this time due to lockdown, but uh, Bo, Christine and Jock will be uh, conducting that conversation at the Capitol in the future. So. Uh, stay in touch and we'll let you know further details about that. So um, before I hand over to our last speakers for this evening, who are going to close tonight's event with very special address and screening, it's really important for me just to take a moment to say thank you. Over 14 years, Open House has been built on the generosity of extraordinary and dedicated people. Uh, all of our speakers tonight are an excellent example of that and who all freely contribute their knowledge, time and support to get behind Open House Melbourne and its intention to bring everyone together to talk about the future of our built environment and how we can create a better future for everybody. So tonight's event, This Is Public, uh, we have some sincere thanks to give to the City of Melbourne, of course, 
uh, our ongoing support from the City of Melbourne uh, is very important. The creative team at the Capitol, led by Geeta, Tim, Eric and the full team, uh, have made tonight's broadcast uh, possible in the most difficult circumstances. And thank you for working with us, all of the speakers and our audience, while we go live tonight. RMIT University and uh, the School of Architecture and Urban Design, who have supported this program, the Naomi Milgram Foundation and the Living Cities Forum have been incredibly supportive as well. And no doubt you immersed yourself in some of those talks today, which were extraordinary. E-front and assemble papers for your support and partnership. And I must say a very heartfelt thank you to all of our donors, sponsors, precinct and practice partners, program partners, our media and digital partners, and our in-kind sponsors. We just literally would not be able to do Open House Melbourne and our year-long program now without you. I'd like to thank the Open House Melbourne Board, the Building Council, the Volunteer Council, and all of our wonderful volunteers who, despite the fact that they could not get out into our public spaces this year, are coming uh, not in, but virtually in during the weekend to help us answer questions and just keep the weekend alive and happening for everyone. And the small and very nimble Open House Melbourne team, uh, of course, Brianna, Helen, Addie, Jess and Sarah, who's currently on maternity leave but will be back with us next week, um, for their hard and much valued work to really um, bring this program to life online in an extraordinarily short period of time. It's due to your hard work and commitment that we were able to do it. So thank you to all of you. Now, it seems very important that we're finishing tonight's This Is Public event with our final speakers this evening, Tristan Wong and Jifa Greenaway. Jifa and Tristan are both architects and they're co-creative directors of In Between an immersive film and installation project that brings together a collection of Indigenous built projects throughout the South Pacific and was premiered at this year's Australian exhibition, digital exhibition at the 17th uh, Venice Architecture Biennale. Jeff and Tristan are going to introduce and foreground their collaboration in making in between. And they're also going to speak to the future of Indigenous and non-Indigenous architectural practice through the making of this film. Following their introduction, we ask you to sit back and enjoy the chance of a full screening of In Between. It's approximately 24 minutes and the screening will bring tonight's event to a close. Um, and it's a very special way for us to finish this is public and we thank Tristan and Jeeva for allowing us to do this. I'm going to hand over to you both now, Jeeva and Tristan. Thank you to everyone for joining us for This is Public, the opening program of Open House Melbourne 2021. And please uh, join us virtually over the weekend to immerse yourself in all that's on offer. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fleur. Uh, Yama Malia, um, hello friend. Um, I'd certainly like to acknowledge uh, Noe, Carolyn Briggs for a um, fantastic welcome and certainly acknowledge traditional owners of the land in which we're gathering, um, those of the Kulin Nation, particularly the Wurundjeri and the Boon Wurrung. And what we've done through in between is really align the thematic by Hashim Sarkis of how will we live together? And this is very, important as we engage with the COVID environment. It, it couldn't be more prescient, really. And we've been on quite an eventful journey. Um, we've brought a little bit of Venice back to Melbourne. And interestingly, while it started off as an intervention within the Australian Pavilion in Venice, um, what we really sought to do as part of our mission is to present architectural works from Australia and across the Pacific region that strengthen cultural understanding between non-Indigenous and First Nations people. We know architecture and the built environment disciplines have been complicit in the colonial story. And this is very much a snapshot in time. And what we've really sought to do um, is to showcase projects which are engaging with um, an understanding of country, holding a mirror up to 
um, you know, the community to demonstrate how architecture can be an enabler. And we've gone through quite an immersive process of engagement, of a culturally respectful process where we've had an important um, gathering of eight significant Indigenous leaders and creatives in support of this endeavour. We've had a fantastic creative team um, supporting the work. Um, and I'd like now to, to hand over to Tristan Wong, um, who's also going to explain a little bit more of the context and backstory to this exhibition. Thank you. Thanks, Jifa. Uh, hi, everyone. Yeah, so as Jifa explained, we, we're very honoured to uh, create this piece as part of the Venice Biennale and uh, align that with Hashim's um, overarching theme, How Will We Live Together? Uh, and the call out we did, uh, we had an incredible call out from um, architects, designers and, and communities from across Australia and the Pacific region. Um, every state and territory uh, within Australia and then um, uh, countries, Samoa, Vanuatu, Papua New Guinea, uh, Aotearoa, New Zealand um, are represented in this in this amazing kind of filmic um, production. Um, what we're showcasing is projects of a whole variety of scales and typologies. So this wasn't about just showcasing projects that are well published, well known, uh, and large and civic. It's also about publish, uh, sort of presenting a series of much smaller, humble, kind of modest scale uh, interventions and projects that have such an incredible impact, positive impact on the communities that they've been designed for. So we really get a great um, diversity of project scales and types. Uh, there was then five chapters that these um, that we sought to kind of uh, tease out in, in this production. And those kind of key themes or chapters are um, country or place, knowledge, language, uh, storytelling and preservation. And they're things that are seen within the Indigenous context, both within Australia uh, and abroad, that were really strong um, uh, elements to to kind of their life and culture and, and seeing how they could tie in with, uh, um, um, you know, contemporary architectural practice. Um, I won't go on. Uh, Jeeva and I really hope you enjoy this incredibly cinematic um, um, project and immersive experience. It's going to be showcased at other places around uh, Melbourne over the coming months. Hopefully, we would love you to see it in person because it's incredibly um, immersive and, and engaging in the, in the flesh. So. Uh, please enjoy this and thanks so much for tuning in.
Ito o ili uni o kita nawai. Ay. Ay, gata. Ay, tam. Tena, ito o ay... Ya, ay... Ito o ang angay tsukuan na kiliya. Tena, tanga ta. O, tanga pator. Tanga pator o tonay mo. Araw-araw, ito 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 Thank <laughs> you.